And um, the book follows kind of the same outline that we've seen in the previous chapters where they, they give you a really high level overview, try to give you a layman's intuition about how things are working before uh, doing more of a deep dive into the, the methodology. And like the last few weeks, we look at examples on the Titanic data set. Um, we look at, you know, pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses of uh, the approach. Uh, and then finally, we take a look at the Dalex package, which the authors created, which is, uh, as we know, a pretty, pretty neat uh, set of tools for doing interpretable machine learning. Um, I already mentioned, you know, we, we went through the breakdown plots and Shapley uh, explanations um, in the last few weeks. Uh, one thing that's noted is that um, the, the breakdown plots and, and the Shapley values could be problematic if you have a really large data set. Um, and by large, I, I, I guess I'm talking about the number of dimensions, uh, so a lot of features. Uh, which comes into play uh, particularly with things like uh, genomics when you're dealing with uh, images, uh, which can have um, you know many hundreds of thousands or millions of dimensions. Um, doing text analysis also uh, is 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 kind of one of these uh, issues where this can uh, come into play. And so Lime uh, is meant to handle. Uh, these situations where we're dealing with extremely high dimensionality. It's a somewhat new approach. From what I understand, it was first published in 2016. So we're talking, you know, eight years tops uh, where this has really been in the public's mind. Um, and the main idea, as we'll go into in, in a few slides here, is we're replacing a black box model uh, approach with, with a glass box. Um, you know, something like a, a linear model where you can easily understand how a prediction is produced. Uh, and, and then finally, the idea with Lime is that it produces a sparse explanation. So if you have a million dimensions, you may only focus on, you know, the top, I don't know, five, 10, maybe dozen uh, you know, features that are, are driving the result. Okay, um, this uh, example here, uh, this, this diagram is meant to give you kind of an idea behind the intuition of Lyme. And uh, just to, to walk you through what's going on here, this is supposed to represent predictions from a complex nonlinear binary classifier. And um, I kind of document down here what, what everything represents, but I, I'll just kind of walk through it. So the, the different colors, the green and the yellow represent the, uh, the machine learning models, uh, kind of, you know, ones and zeros that are, are being predicted, the, the yeses and the noes, uh, right? Because it's a binary classifier um, and it's clearly um, nonlinear in this, in this uh, diagram here. Uh, the X and the Y, axes represent uh, different features. So I think of like an X1 or an X2, uh, right? So um, kind of a complex uh, interaction going on there that's being learned from the classifier. And uh, what we're interested in predicting is, is where that cross is. So that's, that's the, the record we, we want to produce. Um, as we'll go into detail about in a few minutes. Uh, to make Lime work, you have to create artificial data points that are somewhat close to the record of interest or instance of interest. And um, these uh, dots here uh, do represent these artificial data points uh, you know, uh, that are kind of like per perturbed versions of the, the instance uh, of interest. Um, and then the size of the dots here give you an indication of how close uh, these artificial data points are or how similar similar they are to um, 
to the instance that we're, we're really interested in predicting. And then finally, um, you see that yeah, the, the, the line segment there is, is really what Lime is learning. So we've replaced this highly nonlinear classifier with something uh, simple, um, in this case, a, a linear classifier that, uh, that does a pretty good job uh, you know, with that line if you're just trying to segment um, this one particular instance, which is the, uh, that, that uh, cross that we're seeing in the diagram. Okay. Um, one thing that's uh, pointed out by the authors is that these the simple models, they, they can be linear models. Uh, realistically, you know, or in practical applications, we tend to see the las a lasso model or, or you know, some, some sort of model with an L1 regularization component to it. Um, and, and that's because we want to have a sparse solution. And if you folks have used lasso uh, in your work or for fun, you'll, you'll know that you, you, what lasso does is it, it basically uh, forces the, the magnitude of certain coefficients to be zero. Um, uh, so it, it's great, you know, sometimes for, for feature selection, because you get rid of the, the, uh, the uh, features that maybe aren't as important. Um, so that's why lasso is, is, is probably the most commonly applied uh, model behind the scenes for Lyme. Uh, decision trees are also mentioned. Uh, you know, they're very interpretable. Um, but all the examples in the book, from what I understand, make use of, of lasso. And uh, I haven't really dug deep into uh, the, the Daleks package, kind of how it's working, but I, I didn't see really an option to say, like, what, what, what glass box model do I want to use, lasso or uh, decision trees? So uh, default, from what I understand, is in fact lasso. Okay, so uh, getting into uh, some, you know, just broadly the mathematical details uh, of what we're trying to do, uh, we're trying to minimize the loss between a black box model, which is represented by F. Um, here and G, which is the glass box model, the simple model that we're using. Um, and, you know, we're, we're minimizing this loss uh, by specifying a class of models, G. And we're doing this in a certain neighborhood, uh, this, this new of X, uh, this neighborhood that's, that's close to the instance in question. Um, and then there's this, uh, additional component uh, omega, uh, which is looks like a regularization term. If you're familiar with with kind of the loss function of lasso, this kind of looks similar to that. Um, in practice, from what I understand, we we don't we kind of just ignore this omega component and we just state a priori like I don't want to have more than <laughs> three features. Uh, to explain, you know, the, the prediction or five or 10 or 15. But um, so really, we're not doing this optimization procedure. Uh, you, you know, we're not like doing cross validation to figure out what the, the appropriate penalty parameter is, we, we kind of just state what it what, what we want, um, before we uh, apply the algorithm. Hopefully, that all, all makes sense. Um, Another thing to uh, keep in mind is uh, the the black box model that we're working at working with uh, can have many features, right? We, p dimensions corresponding to p predictors. Um, the simpler model that we use uh, in Lime will almost always have far fewer um, predictors that are going into that. So we, we're saying q dimensional spaces here. Q is going to be you know, much uh, lower uh, than, than P. And so the, the book then goes into kind of like pseudocode about how to uh, uh, fit this, this uh, glass box model. I, I'm paraphrasing this and, and making it more, uh, it, putting this in a more simplified fashion here. Um, 
but what you really need to do to uh, to produce this glass box model is you need to first figure out like, okay, well, what is my instance that I want to predict on? You you specify ahead of time how many artificial data points do I want to create? Uh, you also say how many predictor variables do I want in my model to explain uh, the prediction? You also need a, a similarity function, um, something to say like how close is this artificial data point that I've created or uh, multiple points in, in total here. But, but for each, each, each artificial point, we need to say how, how similar is it to the uh, instance in question. And then of course you have to specify what kind of black glass box model do you want to use? Uh, for our purposes, we tend to use Lasso. And so once you have these inputs, uh, you know these specifications, you can kind of run run through the the steps. You know you simulate the artificial data points. Uh, you um, you you fit the black box model to the points. Uh, these artificial data points, and, and that kind of becomes your target variable. Moving forward, um, you need to calculate a similarity score between the instance and each artificial uh, data point. Whoops, sorry about that, folks. Let me go back. Just some of the uh, text is getting chopped off, so I apologize about that. Um, so once you've calculated the similarity metric, uh, you want to fit the glass box model. Uh, you use the the n artificial data points that you've already specified as your uh, features. Uh, the black box predictions on those n points is your target. Um, you're limiting to k coefficients that you specified from the from the get go, um, and then as you train the, the the model, which again tends to be lasso, you you apply more weight. Uh, to those training data points uh, that are closer, right, in in distance, or you know, that have a higher similarity to the the instance uh, in question. So you don't treat every artificial data point equally. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Oh, good. good okay. Bar. Okay, very good. Uh, so then the text moves on to this really interesting example of an image, and we'll we'll see that in just a minute here. Um, it's uh, two two hundred forty four by two hundred forty four pixels. It's a color image, and let's say you have a classifier, and the goal of the classifier is to label, you know, what is in this image. Um, using you know a thousand potential categories to, to, to choose from right and so this is a classic multi multi-class classification problem the problem with those previous approaches that we've we've worked through uh is that this the the dimensionality of this problem is, is huge right so just for this single image you have you know, a hundred, almost 180,000 dimensions that you're working with. So it's, it's the two, 244 by 244 pixels, but it's a color image. So you have your red, green, and blues, uh, in there as well. So you multiply all that by three. Um, so, you know, this, this would be very difficult to run like a Shapley, which would probably be very time consuming to run. And then, or, or the breakdown plots where you know you're you're trying to show the importance of every variable and, and it just it wouldn't be readable to the human eye yeah because there'd just be it's just, you know it's too much to look at so the idea when you're working with images is to um, work with what they're calling super pixels um, so uh, in this case you're really just it's almost like you're you're transforming the image into a puzzle right and you're making all these puzzle pieces, like a hundred puzzle pieces. Um, so, you know, you have a, a much smaller problem instead of 880,000 dimensions, it's, it's, it's a hundred uh, that you'd be working with here. So, um, you know, a, a lasso style model can, can certainly handle a hundred dimensions as opposed to the 180 and st still end up with a, a solution that can be interpretable. Um, 
And so here, here's a picture of it. So the the image in the book is is of this fictitious <laughs> uh, goose horse or horse duck. I, I think they're calling it. Um, and and so that's that's the image on the left. And and so we segment it into a hundred different buckets. And that's what looks like these uh, these jigsaw puzzle pieces, right? So there's a hundred hundred of them. We call them the super pixels. And then when you're dealing with images, what you typically do is you randomly exclude some of the super pixels um, as opposed to, to uh, I guess, per perturbing the individual super pixels. You're just kind of taking some out of the picture. And so that's what you see on the right there. Um, so um, all of the pixels are kind of in the, the, the place that they were originally. It's just that you know we're zeroing out uh, certain components there and only showing a a sample of the the total of the the super pixels there. And in the book, they the glass box model is lasso, and they're choosing to use uh, fifteen coefficients to explain um, explain the image overall. And this, picture or the two pictures kind of show you what the lasso model uh, highlights as, as relevant features. Um, uh, so again, it's, it's, it's looking at this original image and trying to say like, what, what is it? And so this is a, a multi-class uh, problem, right? So you get probabilities for, for all of the thousand classes. And so the one on the left is just trying to say, like, what what is the probability that this is a poodle? You know, it's eighteen percent. Uh, I think according to the whatever, I'm sure it was like a a CNN neural net type model. And the lasso model is picking up on a lot of white in the photo, uh, the the dark of 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 the eye of of the duck. And so, if you think about a poodle, a lot of poodles tend to be white. They have dark eyes, um, and you see it's also picking up some, kind of the, the white of uh, the, the horse's leg in here too. So it's it knows that a lot of poodles are white, and it's it's focusing on that. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure uh, how how these models are being fit. Uh, the lasso models, I, 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 I have to think that maybe these are like two separate lasso models you know, kind of in a binary fashion to say like, what's the probability this is Poodle? What's the probability this is Goose? Um, I, yeah, would love to really understand uh, everything that's going on under the hood. But um, in, in any event, uh, the rightmost image, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're saying that it's a 15% probability that the image is of, a, is of a Goose and the lasso model is really picking up on the beak more than anything else. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because ducks, uh, geese, they, they have these prominent, uh, oftentimes orange, orange beaks. And, uh, um, we, we definitely see that. And it looks like it's the lasso is also picking up on, uh, the, uh, the feathery, I don't know if that's the tail, <laughs> although I thought it was a horse's body. If I look up here, yeah, I guess, I guess it's the horse's tail, but it's, it's uh, picking up on on you know a characteristic that that you would see potentially in a goose, which is you know a, a tail or, or kind of a feathery thing going on. All right. Yeah. I would like any, to... any... Yeah. what's that, Angel? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I would like to point that uh, it's really interesting the super pizza that they select. You know, it's like the the selection of super pizzas are really important. Uh, they don't explain how they do but because for this example uh, I don't know if exploratory factor analysis could be a method or maybe mm -hmm. using unsupervised learning like a uh, get and means or a hierarchical clustering maybe but you know that the the super pieces that they said it looks really well you know like you don't you don't do that manually yes Yes. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, the lasso model is being fed roughly 100, 100 super pixels, right? You're saying keep keep 15. And that's what each of these represent. 
these are the 15 super pixels that were deemed to be relevant by lasso yeah and that i i, I mean the the division you go up yeah that division that you see from first image to the second one that they break the all the pizzas because they, they explain oh we were going to explain rather than showing the color for each pizza let's just break the in super pizza with zero on one just on and off that is a really interesting uh, simplification you know uh, and maybe that's what they're trying to illustrate when we use quartiles uh, and use zero one rather than using numbers. So yeah, maybe that that's a part of feature engineering in each part. Like maybe the model that you are using doesn't don't won't break that for you, or maybe have some assumption how to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I find this uh, this whole approach to be really fascinating. And uh, I, I definitely don't consider myself to be an expert on like deep learning, but um, I, I'll be honest, I, but I, I have had some exposure to it and I have not seen kind of Lyme in action on, on neural nets in, in the past. Have any of the folks here used Lyme or seen it in action or read about it before before reading about it here? No, that's the first time for for yeah, image data. Yeah. You know, actually, this one maybe kind of uh, shows about uh, some of the localized approaches. Because uh, rather than the scanning to the, all the pixels of the images to interpret what is to look like, we just uh, try to simplify and try to segment it about a hundred pieces, and then these hundred pieces is also still have a higher dimension because there's a lot of combination in it. So mm -hmm. what the line does is we always, we, let's take out the maybe 15 samples in this case, and then try to, what the question is based on this kind of a 15, which is the localized means is a, like a segmented kind of a pieces of the piece image puzzles. Can we, can we, uh, predict the original images to do this. And then uh, to predict the original images, what's the main component segment that is affect to the prediction of the original images. And also this picture also represents about the, some of the limitation of the line approaches because this, in case of these kind of a funny looking goose horse kind of images, depending on the what kind of uh, puzzles we have to sample, it sometimes uh, predict like a photo based on the, these white feathers, or sometimes based on the, maybe sometimes when we sample, was able to the sample the, these beaks for the, for the goose, that actually have a lot of inferences to to the predicting the, okay, this is the goose kind of things. So that means even if we have to be sampling these kind of images to predict the original images, depending on the, what kind of a sample we're gonna choose, a sample or image puzzles we're gonna choose, that sample, each sample does not have the same weight. So maybe in case of the beaks, like in the, in the goose, that actually have a very key kind of a puzzle that uh, uh, model allow model gonna be predict for the goose kind of things, and also maybe if 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 we can sampling about uh, these horses, uh, horses tail and then uh, some white leg in the in, in front, that is a much more probable to look that this might be the horse, and then uh, this actually represents about the sum of also limitation of the, these line approaches. Because in case of the, this kind of a funny uh, looking images, mm -hmm. depending on the what kind of a segment we're gonna choose, prediction gonna be very. So, but anyway, it is very good and effective approaches, rather than rather than the scanning all the all of the pixel or rather than the try to try to scanning the hundred kind of dimensions. We just only choose the 15 or just kind of a manageable 
sample size and you know, try to predict the original images. It is more like an efficient kind of a approaches to predict the images or text analysis. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, good good recap there of, of kind of what's going on. And I I, I really like how visual this is. Uh, you know, of course we're dealing with images, so you kind of need a visual uh, way to explain what what's going on. And um, if if any of you guys have, have looked at neural networks, particularly the the CNNs uh, that are used with images, uh, you know, like there's there's a cool uh, literature on how to visualize what each layer of the 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 neural net is 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 learning right like early early layers are learning like line segments and then you get to more complex shapes in, in later segments and then towards the end you're you're uh you know it's learning um i don't know parts of a hand or an eye or a foot you know if you're if you're talking about humans um and and this kind of reminded me of that um yeah you know I, i'm not exactly sure how that other technique for cnn's work but but uh it's just so cool um, that you're you're kind of peeking under the hood of the black box uh, in this such a visual visual way that you're kind of just lighting up those areas of the the photo that were were relevant right for for learning purposes. Um, so yeah. And what do you um, think about because we have two numbers right in the in, you have probability yep. and explanation fit. Yes. I'm guessing that the probability. Come from the original mother and the explanation fit yes. come from the yeah. I think That's... I think you're right. I think the you know this is a a model. The black box model is is multi class, so it's not outputting one probability. It's a thousand, and uh, mm. th these that's you know eighteen was the output for poodle, fifteen was the output for goose, and then the the fit. I I think it's probably an R squared. Um. Or, yeah, well, this right. is classification, so I'm not 100% sure. I mean, there's the things like pseudo R squared for... <laughs> no, I think that Lasso, you know, Lasso model just can predict one probability. Yeah, but... Yes. You know, I was that's that's what I was bringing up earlier. If I if mm -hmm. I had to do this myself, uh, uh, you know, and fit a, a Lasso oh. model... I, it would for be, level. They'd be, yeah, yeah. Actually, what this one says is the probability is the, based on the this images what's the probability of the we have to rabble to the goose is the 15 percent so and then if we actually choose okay this is the goose when when we compare to the dead goose images and then you know, these images how how similar are they that's the explanation fit you know because uh, oh, okay. probability is the out of the hundred different images What's the probability of the picking the goose for these images? And then if we say this is the goose, and then compare to the our goose uh images in the training, yeah, in the team uh, in the training data set, how similar are they? Okay. Yeah, how, it, it's yeah. it's some measure of congruence, certainly that explanation yeah. fit. I, I don't yeah. know if it, because this is classification, if that's like a Briar score. Which is about like how calibrated the probabilities are, or or something like that. I don't know, or log loss, or you know, some something like that. I, I don't know, but because it's it's a classification, it probably isn't R squared, in this case. Yeah. yeah. Um. But a Angel, earlier you were you were talking about like yeah, when I think of lasso models, I I don't think that the standard uh model would allow you to output multiple probabilities, right? So I would think you'd have to fit separate lasso models like like two separate binary classifiers one one lasso model based on the probability that it's a poodle and then another one based on the probability that it's a goose yeah that should be the the solution yeah and that's why we have different fits yeah because mm -hmm. they run a lasso to prove it's a poodle and the fit was bad you know 37 percent and they they oh let's go to the second one and yeah it seemed more like a goose and yeah, if you see the image, yeah, it made more sense to be a, a, a goose because we know that the original image was a goose holes, you know? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is a good discussion, everybody. Um, and this, to me, this was the most interesting section of the, of the chapter. Um, one point that was brought up is, uh, you know, we're, when you're dealing with extraordinarily high dimensions, 
um, you, you you suffer from the, the curse of of high dimensionality, which basically means every point is really far from each other. Like, right? Because you're just you, it's hard to find points that are exactly identical to each other. Um, and and so um, I, I think that's why. It, it, the recommendation for images was not to do these uh, pertur perturbations, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, but instead to just kind of do on and off as we were showing in this uh, this diagram up here where you're just showing certain cer certain super pixels and some of them were, were um, uh, whited out. Um, but there was a uh, discussion about like what you do, particularly with tabular data, uh, like when you have a continuous feature, if you if you want to simulate around the instance, like one thing you could do is just add Gaussian noise. So just, you know, basic randomness around the value that you're seeing. Um, there are other approaches where you can basically discretize uh, the continuous variable into two. Or sometimes I guess you could do maybe more, but um, I think the examples in the book, a lot of times you're breaking up the continuous variable just into two components. Um, and then if you're dealing with binary variables, uh, one thing you can do is just randomly change some of the, the zeros to ones and, and kind of the ones to zeros. OK, um, now we move on to the Titanic data example. And uh, this, is, this is what's interesting. For a, a lot of these uh, Lyme procedures to work, you need to uh, simplify, lower the dimensionality of the existing feature set. And a couple of examples that were thrown around for how you could do that with the Titanic data set is recognize that like um, class of the passenger in the Titanic data set and the fare that, that a passenger paid are similar and signs of wealth. Um, in terms of demographics, uh, you know, age and gender kind of fall into a broader demographic category, and you could combine those two together into uh, potentially one one variable or um, something similar to that. Um, but the approach that they actually took um, in this subsection was that they um, discretized uh, the continuous variable age, or right, or it's uh, roughly um, continuous. They bucketed into like above above fifteen and some change, and then less than or equal to 15. Um, and, uh, and, and so you're left with just a dichotomous variable. And then it, it, they simplified class. Uh, we know that there's the first, second, there's a third class, and there's the deck crew. And I think there's some other ones too, but they just uh, broke that out into uh, first, second, and deck together, and then everything else. So again, a dichotomous variable. And then uh, here's just example output, uh, you know, with, with a simplified feature set. Uh, of course, you didn't have to simplify gender because you're already binary, you know, male or female um, in, in this particular data set. And, um, you know, the, the, the output here is kind of what we would expect. We know that males were much less, less likely to survive, um, hence the um, extreme negative uh, feature influence for for being male. Uh, however, the the passenger Johnny D was pretty young. I can't. I think I think the Johnny D was eight, maybe. I, I'll have to double check, but certainly a, a a minor, and so that that really helped out. And then finally, uh, this passenger was, I think, in first class. You know, keep me honest if I'm if I'm wrong there, but um, the the passenger was on one of those classes where survival was more likely. So we we see that flow through here. Um, and, oh, and in this example, yeah, you know, we were really only keeping three, three features, um, using lasso, uh, pros and cons, uh, like the other, uh, approaches that we've, we've seen so far, it is model agnostic. This can be applied to any, any sort of model type, which is great. Um, it's providing interpretable explanations just like our previous approaches. So that's similar. Um, it has uh, local fidelity, uh, meaning that like these glass box models can do a good job of approximating 
the more complicated model within a tight uh, space, right? Um, so it doesn't do a good job globally of explaining what what the um, what the black box model is doing, but it does a decent job if you're just confined to a certain uh, a certain instance or uh, you know features that are close to the instance in question. Uh, as we saw, this is really good for the high dimensionality stuff, uh, images, uh, if you're dealing with uh, a high dimensional text, I guess mo most text is high dimensional, right? So um, if, if I were doing, if I were working with text or images of, you know, I would use this approach over the other ones that we've, we've worked with. Um, there are some, you know, cons, some, some weaknesses of this approach. Uh, there is no like universal standard for simplify for lowering the dimensional space of, of the, the categories that you're working with, uh, right? Like discretizing age, for instance, that we saw, like there, that's almost subjective, right? Um, so the authors of various packages are just gonna have these different ad hoc approaches for the you know, what they consider to be, you know, decent decent methods for for reducing dimensionality there. So uh, long story short is you can't just use Lime in one package and expect to get the same result from another package because there were uh, certain artistic choices that were employed uh, for making the thing work. The good news is uh, we don't have to make those artistic choices ourselves. I, I say that's good. I mean, sometimes you might want to do that, uh, make, make your own decisions for, for simplifying your features, but um, you know, that, that can be very time consuming, um, which, you know, you might not want to spend all of your analysis time just <laughs> working on Lime here. You know, the idea is you just want to figure out why you're getting the, uh, the predictions you are. And so, um, the, the fact that there are multiple implementations, multiple packages out there means like if, if you're really worried about maybe some of the artistic choices in a particular package, you could run it three ways, you know, for multiple packages and just see how they differ. How, how they differ. <clears throat> um, this was listed as a con. Uh, you know, the, the glass box model is fit to black box predictions. It's not actually necessarily fit to the, the, the true data well, which seems obvious to me. And I, I, I don't know why that's really listed as a con. It just kind of, by definition, that's, that's how Lime works. You're trying to approximate the black box model as opposed to trying to model out the real data. You're modeling a model is what's happening. Um, and then we, we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you know, finding, producing artificial data points uh, that are somewhat close to the instance in question can be tough when you're dealing with really high dimensional data. Uh, it's the, the curse, of, curse of dimensionality. Um, I would say for a lot of the data sets that I, deal with in the real world that are probably small or medium in size, I would not use Lime. Uh, you know, like the Titanic data set is, is a good example where like the break the breakdown plots and Shapley values work really well. Uh, there aren't that many features to begin with, right? You have a handful uh, or, you know, up to like a dozen, a couple dozen. I, I think those approaches work really well. I, I think you lose you know, you lose stuff when you're doing Lime, right? By definition, you're kind of simplifying uh, the, the features that you're starting off with. So in some respects, you you are getting a cruder um, uh, approximation or interpretation of what's going on. And, and that's not necessary, in, in my opinion, if if you're not dealing with a lot of variables to begin with. So this is kind of a a, a funny example of the Titanic data set to, uh, to uh, employ the uh, the lime technique, although you know, there's the authors obviously are trying to be consistent um, and use this throughout the book. But uh, I would say, um, again, for smaller dimensional problems, the the other techniques that we we reviewed are probably more appropriate. Does anyone want to disagree with me on that? No, no, I agree. I would just like to point that in this case, it's it's hard to know what is close enough, you know, you want the neighbors and you want to create your neighbors. But for example, let's play, mm -hmm. ah, you can add, for example, random noise to your variables, but you are talking about 100 variables 
how many variables do you want to affect, for example, is important. And how much from one to zero, for example, how much is, do you want to install? So it's not like a rule that you, you are explaining like the const, that you don't know you are going to affect 15 or one. So it's hard to know if you are taking your, your analysis too far of the observation or maybe too near. So your explanation is too, uh, too narrow, you know. And yeah, and the other way around, maybe I'm thinking about, hey, maybe when you have many features, the another approach that maybe we know is to apply a, a dimensional reduction technique and then use breakdown plots, maybe. If that was the, the, the way that we train the model. Yep. Yep. Yeah, those, I, I mean, I think, I mean, breakdown plots and Shapley values are both pretty appropriate for, for the Titanic data set. I think, you know, again, you don't, you don't really have to simplify much to employ those. No, and uh, are easier to explain because in this case, you see some coefficients, but they won't zoom to the, to the, yeah. to the result because they are making an approximation to a model. It's yeah. not like breakdown plots that you have, it's the sad value. Yeah. Well, that prediction, the feature cost of building with, with this amount, and it's easier to understand in, in the brilliant perspective yep. because you are using that, uh, that dimension. All right. Um, yep, that, that makes sense, Angel. Okay, uh, so final section is just, uh, you know, how do you implement this in R? And um, there's a few, uh, packages here, just I'll point them out. Lime is, is the first one that's noted. And I, I'd say if, if you go back and forth between Python and R, you might want to use that Lime package because uh, the R version uh, is apparently a port of the Python library. So I would say you'd probably get similar results uh, if you you know use, use this Lime package and, and did something similar in Python. And then the other two are R specific uh, implementations of Lime. Uh, local model, um, and they use uh, the Ceteris Paribus profiles. And I, honestly, I have not read ahead yet in the book. I know that's foreshadowing, I think, the, the next topic we're going to be discussing. And then the IML package is another one. Uh, I noted in that the, one of the authors of, of the IML package is, uh, I think, Christopher Molnar, and he's the guy that wrote the uh, interpretable machine learning book. That's pretty popular, um, and, and we discussed this in a in a prior uh, meetup here. Uh, that you know that was kind of in contention. That other book was kind of in contention for the, this R book club. But that the problem with that book is it doesn't really focus on the code, and you know this is an R <laughs> book club, so you want to see some some R code in action. But just wanted to point that out. Like if you decide to read this other book, um, uh, you know they may speak. Uh, to this package, um, you know, or, or how this implementation works. I don't know that for a fact, because I haven't read that other book, but uh, I just wanted to point out that like, hey, this this <laughs> other author wrote this package. Um, so that's that's uh, interesting. Um, another thing to point out is, so we have these three different packages. Fortunately, the authors of the book we're currently reading uh, have created the, the Dell Extra package that serves as an interface to all three of those packages. So you can use similar syntax uh, to, to fit Lime using these, these you know, alternative uh, Lime approaches and just use the predict surrogate function to do so. Um, and if you uh, don't tell predict surrogate which Lime method you want, it, it's gonna use the local model package. So just keep that in mind. I know I, certainly with a lot of, um, modeling that I do, I, you know, don't, don't screw with the defaults a lot of times, just leave them at their default. So if you do that, you're going to be using the, the local model uh, package. And as far as I can tell, um, the glass box model is in fact, lasso under the hood. Um, I haven't played around enough to really know if you can vary that from lasso. Um, like, is there a way to change that to decision trees? Um, that's yet to be determined, but the default is definitely um, lasso there. Okay, so uh, I'll just quickly, you know, run through this. We're, we're loading the data. Uh, the 
both the, the Titanic data set and the random forest model that the authors have already fit. And then we instantiate this uh, explain object from the Dalex package. This is uh, similar to what we've, we've done in the past. I think this is the exact same explainer syntax for, for the other models as well. Um, and then we we kind of look at the three packages, how we would um, how we would fit uh, a lime explainer, and so uh, we're looking at John, the past the fictitious passenger Johnny again, um, and uh, again the the function is predict surrogate. You know, you you get you give it uh, inputs of like, well, what is my explainer? It's the Titanic random forest explainer. Uh, we're predicting this on Johnny D. That's our, our new observation, limiting this to three features total. And um, we're going to create a thousand artificial data points to make this work. And, and this is uh, the Lime algorithm. And uh, this is going to be small. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, but uh, this it outputs a lot of information. Uh, the most relevant would be because this is a lasso model, there's an intercept, it's a right, just, just like in any normal linear model. And then it, it outputs uh, feature weights, which are uh, the coefficients for, for the individual uh, co uh, for the individual features. Um, and yeah, so each row here represents a separate feature and we've limited it to three here. So the first one is gender, second one is age, uh, and then and then class. So you can put this all together in a linear format, uh, right? That intercept of 0.557 is a basic probability. Because this is a male, the probability is lower of survival by 40 percentage points. Uh, the, the, um, under the hood, the, this Lime implementation split up the ages into less than or equal to 22 years of age and, and greater. Um, and so because this individual is below 22, uh, you know, that increased the chance of survival by about 17%. And then finally, yeah, this person is in first class. And um, we know that that adds uh, some additional value for the probability of survival by about 15%. Any, any questions on that uh, Lyme implementation? Okay. Uh, and here, just by plotting that object that we just fit, you can you can actually see uh, these uh, explanatory plots that are very similar to what we've looked at in previous weeks. Uh, the prediction and what here is 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 the random forest prediction, so 0. 0.422, and explanation fit in this case 61. That is an R squared um, value, I believe. Um, yeah, well, they're R squared. Again, that's interesting now that I think about it because this is yet another classification task. It's not a continuous variable. Sorry, it's 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 a it's a it's not a continuous target output. Uh, so I wonder if we're treating the probability of survival as like a continuous variable uh, for the glass box model. Because I, I know there, you know, there are lasso implementations that are really logistic regression and then you you can apply lasso like a standard regression uh, where it's a continuous output. So question mark on that, right? Uh, how this R squared I is think being all the approach that we are studying in this book mm -hmm. uh, are all, all only work for nomadic predictions. You know, like even though you have a classification, you are predicting the probability, and that's the approach that they are using. So it's... they are. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a probability, but the question is, is it is it is it a logistic regression with an L1 regularization component, or is it really just a regular regression, right? I Treating think it's a regular regression, you know, because I don't think that they are using a... It's like we are assuming, like, you are using a, a short distance. So if you are using the short distance of the lasso regression, I think you won't have that problem of overcoming one probability because you are trying just to pick uh, that space. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like yep. you this regression won't work outside that scope. If That's you right. move, if you move the scope, 
or it's like the first image that you show, do you remember like they fit a linear regression even though there were some curves after that place. So this uh, model is not general to the prediction. It just works for this specific point. So like when you are in calculus, you know, like you can fit a, a straight line even in a curve just because you are spending yeah. a point. Yes, and that that's actually a really good analogy, the straight because that's that's what we're doing with regression, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. or a plane or or whatever. It just extended to multiple dimensions, but exactly. But but yeah, you're right. It you you know a straight up regression would probably work. So I mean, I'm sure we we could dig into the source code and figure out if they're just fitting a regular regression, and maybe they are. But you're right, since we are just talking about a particular instance and you know features around that space that would probably work just fine for the purpose that it's created for which is just we're trying to understand the prediction and it's, even though your prediction goes over one percent you know that the explanation doesn't work and that's even a good point yeah. you are not finding no, uh, maybe your permutation wasn't so close to the point as you thought it was you know mm -hmm. maybe that will help us to understand if we are really close to the point or not if you're getting like strange output. Yeah, it's like if you is your permutations, if you vary too much and you are too much noise, maybe you are you are not close to the point. You are also adding more general predictors. So when you feed your linear model, then you will get probabilities higher than you, you should have in your in your yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> but because the point is that the prediction should be close. The the model prediction, it was forty two, I I think. Yeah, they they have been really close. Yep. The, from the original model, I mean. So, the the prediction that you that you have in your line model should be really close to the prediction that you are getting from the original model. Right, the four two two, which again exactly. is that's mm -hmm. the random forest prediction in this case. Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't play with this to actually see what the lasso. Oh, actually, we 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 do have that. It's uh, it is here, and I, it got chopped off. Um, and I don't think it's forty two in this instance. I think it's more like forty eight percent. Um, but it's it's reasonably close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, um, you know, there's just two more um, libraries where uh, Lime is implemented that that it's documented in in this this chapter, and the other. So the, the second example is with local model, uh, and so it, you still use this the predict surrogate function. Some of the arguments are a little different here. I think this was one in particular where, like, I. Don't, I don't think you can even specify the number of coefficients. At least I think I tried, and um, it was still giving me <laughs> five five coefficients as output. Um, and then one other thing is like this: this allows you to set a seed so that you can reproduce the same uh, output every time. However, I had trouble um, getting the the books output uh, exactly, and I think that's because. Uh, the authors are probably using a different version of R, like a prior version. And I know like the the set seed thing has actually changed over time, like how that algorithm works. And so like a, a seed of one in a current version of R might actually be different. Get You might get a different result uh, from like a, a seed of one in an, another version of R. So um, just keep that in mind. I think someone else who presented had a similar issue where they couldn't exactly reproduce what the authors were getting, but you get pretty close. Um, yeah, so similar kind of output uh, where you can see like there's an intercept, this is a lasso model, right? And because this is a male, the, the, the probability of survival is lower, but because it's a, a minor, uh, High, there's a higher percent chance of survival, and this is this individual's in first class, also, which which helps uh, with overall survival probability. Um, the local model package package is interesting because it will it lets you kind of see under the hood of how it's discretizing 
the uh, continuous variables. And so there's a, an example using this function plot interpretable feature. And age is, is the only continuous variable we have. And you know, so x axis is age. Value here, I believe, is probability of survival. And what you see is that there's a huge drop off um, kind of around age 15 in survival probability. And so, so this is, in, in a sense, kind of cheating, right? The, the model is, uh, it's, it's discretizing the, uh, a feature uh, or an independent variable based on looking at the target, which is survival probability. And, and so, yeah, it, it just, um, I, I don't know all the mechanics of it, but you can certainly get the intuition behind how it's actually making the decision to use roughly age 15 as its um, uh, cut, cutoff point for uh, creating a, a binary type uh, variable. Um, and then, you know, like, like the other model, you can easily plot this just using a plot function. And uh, finally, you know, there's the IML package, which was uh, in part written by Christopher Molnar, the author of the other uh, interpretable machine learning book. Uh, in this one, you could specify the number of uh, uh, features that you wanted included, in this case, three, predicting again on Johnny D. And you also get similar output. The betas are uh, similar to the uh, coefficients uh, in that lasso, re um, lasso regression. Oh, IML package. Uh, apparently, uh, continuous variables are not transformed, so they found a way to do Lime without uh, simplifying continuous features. Uh, but the categorical features are dichotomized into just one. You know, the one being the the, the category of the instance in question, and then everything else being a zero. And uh, Another weird intricacy of the IML package is it, it not only spits out probability of survival, it also does probability of dying as well. So it, it seems a little bit redundant, to be honest with you. But like when, when you plot this, it, it you have two plots that are mirror images of each other. The one on the left is saying, how do we determine how these features impact the probability of dying, right? And then the, on the right, which is what we're really interested in, is the probability, how these features influence the probability of survival. Um, and then finally, the at the, the end of the, the chapter, the authors basically say, well, just so you know, age, gender, and class are somewhat correlated features. And um, that can influence how, how Lyme works. And uh, that, that may, in fact, explain why, at least in part, why the different Lyme uh, charts are slightly different than each other. All right. Well, that's um, that's all I had. Any any questions on that? Um, I don't have a question per se. It's just like based on this last point, I wonder if there's a way to like. I wonder if like there's a way to like implement this much like with the uh, breakdown plots that like takes into account those correlations. At the same time, that seems like that's complicating what's already a fairly complicated process, though. So. You know, uh, you know, last week we talked about Shapley values and, and we were wondering about like highly correlated features and how that kind of affects things and inter interactions. And I've been playing around with that a little bit, uh, but I think I'll punt since we're already up on the hour, uh, yeah. maybe talk about it in a subsequent session. But one thing you can do if, if like, if, if interactions are something you're interested in, um, is you could explicitly include that as a feature in your model. So like random forests, we know can pick up on interactions without being explicit in the model formula. But you, it, there, I, I don't think you really harm the prediction by including an interaction in the model formula. Um, and if you do that, that would be treated like any other uh, any other variable. Um, and and that you know you may pick up on the interactions in Lime, but just by doing that. Um, but to your point, Zach, I mean, I, I do think, yeah, there's computational complexities uh, with with capturing interactions. I guarantee, if you Google it, though, there are people that are working on it or have done it, and there's like bigger, better, meaner versions of Lime that that 
maybe maybe pick up on interactions. In fact, I, I, when I was looking at SHAP, um, looking up interactions with with SHAP values, Shapley values, excuse me, over the last week, you know, there's there's papers written about this stuff, and there are ways to get implementations where you can get to the interactions as well. So I think there's probably something similar for for Lime there. It's just is the juice worth the squeeze? In most cases, maybe not, but um, in some cases, yes. And uh, uh, you know, this is why you, you can never just rest on your laurels and learn one way to do things because you know these implementations might not work well if if there are maybe um, extremely uh, important interactions. Um, but if anyone wants to do a little homework on that, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to see what you find uh, as it relates to Lime. Well, that's that's great. You know, maybe the the hard part of this session is that every implement, even though the start point to get the the line fit is the same, but the results that you're getting are different for each model. So maybe that's they might maybe improve that part later. So just to have one type of a uh, result, you know. To have the same table, even they have some missing column, but I think, but even though, yeah, it, it, they saw half of the problem. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think we we've learned just through these various procedures that there there are. Again, I keep calling them artistic, uh, you know, choices there, um, but like breakdown plots, just just how the the variables are ordered, you know, that it's an ad hoc procedure. It's not based on rigorous mathematical theory. And it's it's kind of a similar thing here with some of the processing that's that's done with Lime, right? You, you have to, in some cases, simplify and and uh, you, you make these design engineering choices, um, but uh, everyone's gonna do things a little bit differently. And I think that's okay. That's just kind of how machine learning works, right? <laughs> right, there's yeah. artistry to it. Um, and and so it's and so these these few packages uh, employ different artistic choices and I guess if you really want to nerd out uh, really understand what's going on you know it's it's good to kind of explore really what assumptions are being uh, being made there and not just rely on you know the authors as as making the right choice right it may or may not be the right choice for your particular problem but um, so. So try to learn as much as you can um, and, and how these uh, these uh, methods work. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good for this week. Uh, I would, and again, uh, 